welcome. Hope you're well. So here we are one more time for Q&A. Thank you for joining us from around the world. Where are you all? Say hi. Let's see where you're coming in from. Harriet is in Riverdale, New York. If someone in Washington, someone in Australia, Vegas, Panama, Beit Shemesh. Hi from Jerusalem. That's a Boeing Yale, Levy. Uh, Woodmere, Snowflake. You're calling me a snowflake? It's politically loaded. Florida, Mexico, Baca Raton, Marine Bay, Atlanta, Zurich, no less. Shalom to Great Neck, St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis? St. Louis, that's how you say that. I'm Australian. What do I know? Hi from Clifton, New Jersey, New York. Okay. A lot of pe people, Phoenix, Arizona. Amazing. So we are here. We have about, uh, how long do we have? Just over an hour, let's say, theoretically. And I hope you're well. So rule number one is turn on the cameras. Let's be together. Let's see each other. It helps. It goes a long way. That's number one. Um, number two is we're going to take questions. Um, you can throw at me whatever you want. I don't know the answers to your questions, but together there's a power. There's a power in the group. There's a power in being here together. So we'll see what Hashem can open up for us, what our neshamas open up for us, what the Siddiquim open for us. Who knows? Who knows? People in general are saying, with all that's happening in the world, and there's so much happening in the world right now, you know, how do we stay sane? How do we stay normal? What are we supposed to do? And, you know, there's no end to those answers, who we are individually, who we are as a nation. There, there could be many different people from many different backgrounds and nations here tonight. Everybody is welcome. But one of the things I'm thinking a lot is the importance to work on boundaries. You know, a lot of what we're seeing right now, a lot of what war is capitalistically, and we will do a, a class on that in the next few weeks. What What is the Kabbalah of war? What is the Kabbalah of Kargo Magog? You know, I've been threatening to give you a class like that for a few weeks now, and I have something beautiful. And, and once the energy is there, we'll make that happen. Um, but it's this idea of what boundaries are, what Gavura is, what uh, Gadarim are, fences are. And there's politics to say here, and there's Kabbalah to say here, and there's psychology to say here. But our enemies that invaded were not, were not new to us. They were not unknown to us. We knew that they were there. We knew that they wanted to do that. We kept capitulating to their demands. We gave them more land. We gave them more opportunity. We gave them more time. And we didn't trust ourselves. We didn't trust our inner voice. We didn't trust that we know good versus evil. We, when the world told us what we should do um, and bow down to that, we said, uh, maybe they think we're not into peace, so maybe we shouldn't make peace. Um, maybe we should make peace. Maybe we have to make more peace. Maybe we have to bend over back and make ourselves more vulnerable, more giving. Um, and it seems that we did not know how to listen to our own voice. And it seems we did not know how to define our own, our own boundaries. And every time I hear people talking about the subject i just think back a thousand thousand times to many times i've dealt with women in abusive relationships with men who are physically abusive or psychologically abusive and it's exactly exactly the same it's exactly the same model it's exactly the same language of a person that questions themselves a thousand times and they know that the husband is unhealthy but they tell themselves maybe we can make it work maybe it's fine and the husband says it's because you're not good enough because you don't get your act together so the woman could be yeah maybe it's my fault and maybe i have to take it on and maybe i have to do more therapy maybe i have to do more work and when Baruch Hashem, Bezrat Hashem, they get out of that relationship and they they look back and they find the courage and they find the strength and they find the clarity to stand up to know what's right, to know that this is not going to work, to know that it's really they're, they're unhealthy and it's not gaslighting, it's really me that's unhealthy. And once she can get that clarity and create those boundaries and move on and set herself free, then, then what you hear is decades of what took me so long. You ever been in a relationship like that? It doesn't have to be a married couple. It doesn't have to be a man or woman. I've been in other relationships with that. I'm not going to get into that whole gaslighting approach. And and what what you hear for years, which is a, a, a painful thing to hear and a wonderful thing to hear, is what took me so long? What took me so long? How did I 
get stuck in my own head that I was not willing to protect myself or my children? How did I rationalize this relationship? It's so hard to get a divorce. What will people say? What will everybody else think about me? Maybe it is my fault. Maybe I don't deserve any better. Maybe I always had a coming. Well, maybe I should have more compassion on him. Maybe, you know, maybe if somebody loved him and had more compassion longer, then it would have worked. These are exactly, exactly the same as what you see is happening to Israel and the Jewish people today. And, and, and what you see in these dynamics of these relationships, which is heartbreaking and profound. And so much of our relationships are like that. So much about we don't trust our own voice. We don't trust our own value. And we often let ourselves get trotted on. It's not every dynamic and every problem, but some of us have that problem. So especially empathic people, especially sensitive people, they're more likely to get stuck in that relationship, a relationship with a narcissist or a relationship with someone abusing them or gaslighting. I've seen cases even when when a couple like that has gone to a therapist and, you know, the husband says, let's go to a therapist and the husband Cherry picks a kind of a therapist that will, will blame it on the woman. You know, Israel can go to the therapist, they can go to UN and they can go to other countries and the country can say, yeah, it is your problem, right? You should, it's Israel should take more responsibility. It's definitely all of Israel's fault. So this is a reality. This is a reality that we live in. And the answer is boundaries that come from Das. Gadar and Gavulim that are born from Das. True awareness, true awakening to who are we. What is the clarity that I know? Not blaming it on anyone else, not looking to be saved by anyone else, not looking to anyone else to tell me what to do. If I know my own strength, if we know our own light, if the world says we're genocidal people, it doesn't matter. We know we are full of love and we know we are full of compassion to a flaw and we know our values are truly peace. Then that needs to be enough for us to be able to act to protect ourselves. And the fact that we don't is because we're lost in a world where we've identified with every other culture's values but our own. With every other culture's values but our own. We don't know what it means to be a Jew anymore. We're asleep behind the wheel. Our das is in Gullus. So this is a brutal process of awakening. And when you're asleep behind the wheel and there's a crash, has for Khalil, your person pays the price. But, but the price is, is a shem waking us up and saying, remember who you are, remember what your values are, disconnect from the world, remember yourself, remember what we stand for, let that be enough to guide and inform our decisions moving forward. Once you get out of these destructive relationships, then we are free to step into our light and power, step into our power. And until we do that, we are condemned to live it over and over again. Do you see that now? Have you been thinking along this? Do you see those patterns, how it's always the same? When you work with people who are victims in difficult, abusive relationships, you see the Jewish people are playing that. We're playing that. We fall into a victim mentality. And we've forgotten that we're supposed to be a light. When we're not the light we're supposed to be, the darkness in the world is our fault. And we fell asleep behind the wheel for 2000 years. And in the last, since 2005, we fell asleep behind the wheel, we knew what we we're giving away. And as a generation, as individuals, we're all asleep behind the wheel. How many Jews today don't know their light, don't know their power, don't know their gift, their contribution to the world? How many ways in our own way do we sense that? I know many secular Jews today, who would consider themselves left-leaning or liberal, and I'm not judging politically, I don't consider myself left or right, but there's all kinds of complexities. And, and today they're in a, a bind internally with a lot of pain, saying there's certain values that they value very much. And, and they're pulled because they love Israel and they love the Jewish people, but they have values that are taking them the other way. And that schism puts them asleep behind the world because they can't unify, rectify, align what a certain culture is pushing them towards and what their feelings are in their own heart. We're all in a very difficult place, but I promise you, this is a wake up call. And the good news is I really believe with all my heart, we're hearing it and we're awakening. We're awakening. It's happening right now. Can you see that? Can you feel that? And we have to strengthen ourselves and we have to strengthen each other. And we have to strengthen the people around us that could be strengthened with love and compassion and patience. 
I mean, this decision to defeat the enemy or free the hostages and the realization that you can't have both. I mean, what's the answer to that question? Aren't you glad you're not BB, whether you like him or not? Aren't you glad you're not his decision right now? I've been listening to Shirim from every Rav I could hear about what the halakhic solution to that problem is. You know what the halakhic solution is? The halakhic solution is let's never let ourselves get into that dilemma again. But these kind of questions that have no clear answer, that break our hearts to pieces, are supposed to break our hearts so they can be reborn and reawakened with power and clarity and strength so we never have to let this happen again. Can you hear that? So take in the pain as much as you need to take in it to do the work to awaken yourself and our people. Don't take in a drop more. Don't take a drop of the trauma in more. Don't let it diminish you, but it can awaken you. As long as you feel the fire, let it fire you. And then let's channel that to change and growth and unity and love and appreciation of who we are. We fight the darkness, not just by destroying the darkness, but by drawing in new light. I believe with all my heart, our borders of the empty soul have to be stronger and firmer. Our resilience against our enemies to take it all the way and completely eliminate them has to be stronger and firmer than it ever was, uncompromising. And at the same time, Torah, Mitzvah, Kedusha, Tshuva, we have to transform ourselves. We have to unite ourselves. How would our lives be different today than they were two months ago? How are Jewish values? We don't care if we're Jewish or not. The majority of the Jewish people doesn't technically care anymore that the whole world is marching through the streets, calling us all Jews once again, once again seeing this kid on college campus putting on tefillin saying, I have no idea what these are, but I want to do something Jewish. My gosh, Hashem knows what he's doing. I'm sorry it comes to that. But when he puts that on, he set it with a fire and he feels a fire and there is a fire. So that fire is the fire that we're lighting this Hanukkah. That fire is what's awakening within us all. And we can't go back. We can't go back. We will go back, but we can't go back. Just waiting for the war to die down so all the Israeli politicians left and right can launch on each other again. How are we going to stop that? How are we going to make it different this time? How are we going to learn the ultimate lesson? How are we going to find respect for each other, left and right, religious and secular? What is the Sada Shava B'nayim? What is it that unites us together? And how are we going to keep that fire burning strong? Can we disagree with the Yid and still respect them and still support them and still love them and still fight for them? We're in an abusive relationship with each other right now. That's changed in the last few weeks, but now we have to learn the lesson and make it different from this day evermore. Can you hear me? Okay, emotional check-in. Everything I'm saying right now, in one, one line, what's your feedback? What's your response? Where are you with it? Rebecca hears me, Andy hears me. Shmuel says, motivating, very moving. Truth, yeah, makes sense, absolutely true. Emma, still confusion. Great, the world is not done. I'm feeling the fire in my heart very well. Terrified, yeah, it's terrifying, it's true. Fear, truth, encouraging, fine. Earth shattering and mending, yes, and how? Practically, great, brain fog, know the feeling. Torah is the answer, fear, 100% with you. Truth and verifying, ripple the wisdom out. Scared, fair enough. Nancy? Okay, so these are coming in faster than I can read them. Thank you, everybody, for being here. If you have a question, please raise your digital hand. I'm going to try not get caught in long answers to questions today. We're going to zoom in. We're going to do the work. We're going to move on. These are the questions. Has everyone raised their hand? Who's going to raise their hand? Fine. We're going to start with Gina. Is that the right name? Gina? Hi, Gina. Apologies if I got it wrong. No, you got it perfect. Thank you. I'm not sure if you remember me. You had me on about three weeks ago and you gave me homework to do. And you asked me to come back and report to you. Um, so not only do I have reports, but I have 
all my testimonies of pages and pages. I asked Paula you Kavad, in one sentence, remind us what the homework was. I will. I asked you a question um, and you asked me about how my balance is in life. And then you told me to listen to the Kabbalah of empaths. I uh -huh. So I did. And every single time that I was able to remember to write down when I had tried the method, I did. And there was at least about 30 um, times that I did per day for the past three weeks. What I found out is that I am not an empath. I have the largest ego in the world. <laughs> I, I finally understand what it means, what Reb Nachman means about Portal. Um, and it's a very, very wonderful feeling. And I finally understand I thought I had Bitachon. Now I understand, wow, I so don't even have a drop of Bitachon. And I cannot wait to keep climbing higher and higher. But I'm still having a drop of a problem with my original question. My original question Which was? was, I've been doing shuva for the past three years. I've been very far away prior to that for a very long time. And for the past three years, I've been doing shuva. And I feel like I'm very grateful that Hashem keeps knocking on my door. But I, I thought I was answering and the, just the knocks keep getting louder and louder and louder. So okay, and you've just the, answered your question, right? I, that's what I'm hoping that I did. And I feel very what, what, privileged. Well, what, what's I the can... answer to the question that you've just said out loud? What's the answer to the question that I said out loud? I said yeah, that you keeps just knocking on my door and I thought it was no, answering. Now go back. 30 times a day, Gina, what did you find? Um, that I was relying on Hashem and I was loving Hashem and I was feeling Hashem's blessing and I was feeling close to Hashem and I was answering his call. Wait, so let's rewind there. Wait, wait, rewind. Listen to yourself on the video. You said 30 times a day you found out there was ego. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The dark, so, yeah. Okay. So let's start there. You thought you had, but now I know you are an amazing person and you're working incredibly hard. So don't buy the lie that you thought you had, but talking this all ego. I don't think you're the most egotistical person in the world because the most egotistical person in the world wouldn't be taking that work so seriously and growing, etc. But holy people who are deep souls were looking for that little ego that keeps coming up and rising up. The Balsam Tav, the Uriyakadash said, even in the last moments of their deathbed, they were watching themselves for ego and they could see it coming up. Let's die in a holy way right now. What would be my final words? Let's make it holy. Even the Balsam Tav warned that, he saw it in himself and warned that to his students. So you said, Hashem keeps coming at you. Now there's no force that Hashem wants to come at you more with and heal you more than ego. So here's the question, 30 times a day, give or take, what did you find? What, given this example of a little thing that came up that you, by the time you went through it, you was like, oh, there's my ego again. Well, as soon as I was feeling darkness, and that's when I submitted and, and connected to Hashem, then, then I realized my darkness was me. What am I lacking? What do I want? What do I expect this person to do? Why? How come they didn't respond this way? Why am I reanalyzing it 5,000 times? What What about me, 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 me? And that's where my ego Beautiful. was. And it was Okay, no so let's clarify. In, okay. in Chassidus, that's, that's you know, bitterly yesh, right? But there's there's two ways that we use the word ga'eva or yesh in Chassidus. Ga'eva is like, I think I'm the most important person in the world. You know, you don't look at to me like, you think you're the most important person in the world. That's one understanding of ego. Another understanding of ego is just all the noise of my mind, the fears and the doubts and the concerns and the pain. And that sounds like that's the yeshus, right? That's what you're dealing with. So you're telling me that 30 times a day, you were able to see that, realize that, and even in a small way, just melt that and release that back to Hashem. Something like that? Yeah. So first of all, does that feel good to do? Because that's pretty awesome. The best thing in the world. It's like it's like true love. It's it's what we're living for. Beautiful. So that's that was a good exercise for you. Is that what we're saying yeah. be, as a begin point? Great. Yes, thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. So first of all, Kalakavad, amazing. Number one. Number two is I want you to take what's the biggest challenge? You say all these hits is coming at you. What's the biggest one that's been in the last year? The biggest one of my life is that my two married daughters um, do not accept my husband. So I have a very split life. I can't be in one place. Um, either I have to be with my husband making him happy or I have to be with my daughters making them happy. That's that's, that's the a tough one. Incredibly hard. And there's nothing a woman wants than to have that family together, that sense of unity and that, that home, that essence. And, and that's divided. OK, we feel that pain. We understand that. How old are your daughters? Uh, 25 and 24. They're both married. Fine. So and this is not their father. 
understood. In one line, what's their biggest complaint against him? I am a and we're not we're assuming this is true or accurate. Just what are they saying that their biggest complaint is? I think they were expecting him to be the father that never loved them. And then he just wasn't able to show the love in the way they wanted that, him to. Right. He was the impossible father that could never feel something impossible to begin with. Okay, great. So I assume you've tried to explain that to them with love. I assume you've tried to create positive experiences to onboard the relationship together. I assume you sound like an intelligent, reasonable person, and you've probably done all of that. So one of the great things to do now is pray. That's the obvious one. And the other thing to do is every time that comes up, do the exercise. That's why 30 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> great. That's it. And, and, when you do that exercise 30 times a day and when it comes up, right, I want you to turn that into a prayer experience. So what that means is it begins by going, here I am again, because I said, there's nothing I want more than my, my, daughter, my children to feel loved and for there to be a relationship and peace, because this is our family now in some form, and we'd like to make that work in some form, but I can't control it. And then you do the exercise. You make everyone disappear. You feel the light of Hashem within you. Everyone can check out that video if you want to see how the exercise works. Um, Kabbalistic tools for empaths somewhere on YouTube. And then when you release that and you get to that light, is that what you get to? That energy, that release and light? Then I want you to take 30 seconds to pray. Hashem, now create peace between these people. Let there be love and caring and unity in my family. So that means you're no longer doing the exercise just to release the ego and come back to your divine self. You're now using that release. And this is a capitalistic trick because that's called malaman. You're taking the fear and the ego and the challenge in there. You're transmuting it back to the light. And the Kabbalists say, this is a little deep, Gina, but as it goes up back to Hashem, as that pain and fear and ego releases through your holy work and goes back to Hashem, then you send a prayer on its wings. Then in that moment, when you release the ego, the bitterly yes, you say, Shem, in the merit of me doing this exercise and bringing you into my heart, may you now create peace and love and affection and unity in this, com even with its complexity in this family. Have you got it? Yeah, thank you. I will try 30 times a day again and again. If you do it three times a day, it's a game changer, okay? There's Rad Hashem, within a very short period of time, you should miracles and tremendous change. Thank Amen. you for joining Thank you so me. much. Thanks for, thank you so we'll much. We'll check in again Shana. next time. Okay. Listen forever. Okay. Shalom. We're going, moving straight to Eliza. <clears throat> I just want to say I'm really impressed. As a rabbi, I've learned to, when you give someone an exercise, you should assume you're never going to see them again and they're gone. When somebody comes back with that clarity in their energy, it's really, and they've done the homework and they're really doing it and they're getting the experience. It's really beautiful. So, wow, this is another Eliza. How can we help you today? Hi, it's me. Yes. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, well, thank you for uh, calling on me. I, um, it's not such a global question. It's more of a personal yeah. question. Sure. I've been struggling um, for a while with uh, food issues. And um, I've, I've gone through a lot of work and meetings and groups and um, trying to figure out like where my issue really lies. I feel like I've identified where it lies. There's, uh, I use it as a comfort tool, um, as a stress releaser. Um, I've had periods of success where I've abstained from certain things and I felt great, but I, I, I fall, once things get really intense, I fall back into There my you are patterns. back again. Eliza, yeah. can I ask you how old you are? I'm 52. Right. Um, have you done any in-depth process of therapy of any any inner work of any variety? Uh, yes, I have. What was the last intense version of that that you did? Um, probably in my um, a couple of years ago when I was working on my uh, food stuff, I was mm -hmm. delving deep into, you know, past issues, um, personal meetos, that type of thing. And what therapy or modality did you use? Um, I did a self-hypnosis. Um, mm -hmm. 
I've done talk therapy. I've done, um, those were the most recent ones. I've done in-person um, therapy as well, but not for a very what? long time. Okay, so great. This is good news. I love to hear your answer because it means you haven't done anything interesting yet. That's not to put you down, but that's to pick you up. That means all, all the great things are on the table right now. Um, I assume you have a certain degree of anxiety. Is that true? Um, to some degree, but I feel like I have addressed it. Um, I've worked really hard I, learning Shara B'Tachon and working on um, talking to Hashem in my own words, um, right. focusing in those moments of like, I I have that ability to just get quiet and and give space um to a certain do that every time every time um in retrospect i I think so (laughs) in retrospect you could make yourself calm could you make yourself calm at every time so what what do you say you you learn shah bitaken which is wonderful and you talk to a shame which is wonderful i mean you kind of said that you don't have it so much anymore because you've done those things. But how often do you have anxiety? Do you feel anxiety right now at all? No. Today, did you feel it at all? Um, momentarily, at certain points, in certain oh, situations, yeah. What brings it up today for you? Um, dealing with future in-laws. <laughs> future in-laws, right. That's when we all know and love. Um and my question is, how did you deal with it when it came up today? Um, today, I flipped the I flipped the situation. I was having anxiety about a certain request that was made of me, and it was giving me a very negative feeling. And um, I turned it around. I said, "Hey, I could look at this a completely different way." You know, this is the Kala's mother, and this is a request she's making, and the Kala wants to do X, Y, and Z, the covered her mother, and um, and that's beautiful. Like, I, it could be a totally beautiful thing, and it doesn't have to be this kind of negative connotation um, experience. Right. So here's an interesting reflection. I asked you, do you feel anxiety I said something like, I, I think you have some degree of anxiety. And you said, no, not so much because you've done Shabbat Tukhan, you talk to Hashem. But then already today, there was yeah. an example of anxiety. So that's interesting. It's interesting to find that it isn't more there when, yes, it's right in front of us, number one. Number two is there's a way that you shifted out of the anxiety. What did you do? You used a kind of a reframe technique. I'm perceiving it this way. If I perceive it another way, now I feel better, Right. So that's great. I'm glad you have that tool. That's wonderful. But what we still see is the anxiety is there. So there's this scenario where the woman's walking down the street and the man comes and she can defend herself. That's wonderful. I'm glad she can defend herself. But my next question is, why is the sweet lady walking down the street when these people can come and get to her? Right? I'd like those people to be taken out of the street and I'd like it to be walking the place without those kind of people around. So there's an interesting question is that A, there is anxiety there. And two is you frame it as it's not there so much, but you're still wrestling with this challenge. Now, it's great that you can wrestle with it. It's great that you've got tools there, but it's still there. Yeah. Yeah. We together? Yeah. Fine. Close your eyes for one second. Think of the thing that made you feel anxious today. Can you feel the anxiety a little bit right now? A little bit, yeah. Great. Where in your body is it? My head. Great. Put your attention on your head. Look at the anxiety and say, Shalom. <laughs> yeah, Shalom. that kind of joyful voice. Shalom. <laughs> I see that you're anxious. I see that you're there. We're not going to do any reframing now. I just see that you're there. How does it respond when you do that? It's waving back at me. Great. We have communication. That's beautiful. So say thank you for waving back. I appreciate it. And I acknowledge that you exist and you're there right now. Thank you. I acknowledge your existence. Thanks for waving back. 
Okay, I want you to look at it and realize that this piece of anxiety is actually a, a part of Hashem. It's literally a part of Hashem. It's literally a little bit of Hashem's consciousness. And it has a beautiful divine purpose in this world. It wants to protect you physically, emotionally, spiritually. It may got lost along the way. It may got a little overwhelmed or invested in its job. So look at it like it's a gift from Hashem. How does it feel when you do that? It's serene. Serene. Well, isn't that interesting? You didn't bury or fight the anxiety, but you found serenity, rechava, in the tzara, in the anxiety. Ask it what its perfect purpose is, what its gift to you is. What is your gift to me? Yeah. It's to help me. To what? To help me. To help you with what? With my personal meadows. What's it helping you with? Because it doesn't sound like it's helping you. It sounds like it's overwhelming your system. In fact, it probably is. What's it trying to do? Help you with your meadows in what way? Help you with your emotions in what way? It's trying to get my attention. For what purpose? To turn back to Hashem. Uh huh. Is that what it says? Yeah. Okay. So I want you to just say to it the following thing I appreciate what you're trying to do. I appreciate what you're trying to do. I absolutely believe you have a purpose in, in my life and the world. I believe you have a purpose in my life and my in the world. But you're overwhelming my system right now. But you're overwhelming my system right now. And you have overwhelmed it for a long time. And you have overwhelmed it for a long time. It's hard in my mind. It's hard on my mind. It's hard in my nervous system. It's hard on my nervous system. It's really hard on your nervous system, huh? Fully it is. Ways. I've I've had issues with sciatica right. and right, right, mm. right. Say to it right now. Can you see, even can with you your see. good intent, the burden you're causing me? Can you see, even with your good intent, the burden you're causing me? How does it respond? It's backing off. Wow, look at that. Put your attention on it still. Don't let it go. Okay. How's it feeling as it's backing off? I'm not sure. Hmm. How do you feel that it's backing off? Relieved. Relieved. Tell it you feel relieved. I feel relieved. Tell it, thank you for listening and being open. Thank you for listening and being open. Think how long it's been doing this and it was willing to listen to you and try its best to change, change its ways. You can appreciate that. You can tell it that. I appreciate how long you've been here trying to help me. Old dogs doing new tricks. That's what it's doing. Tell it. Thank you for changing. Thank you for being, having bitter, having a willingness. Thank you for changing. Thank you for having willingness. Take a moment just to feel a light and a love of Hashem within you right now who gave you that gift. Hashem brought us this gift now. Ask Hashem to empower you and your das and your midas and your fear to restructure and reorder in a new, healthier way. Where you feel calm. Just say it in your mind. We you feel calm, where you feel centered, when your nervous system can relax and relax and reorder and your body can trust. Trusting is hard for you. It has to be able to feel the trust in your heart so much 
to feel trust for Hashem so much that your anxiety doesn't have to try and protect you anymore. Ask Hashem to give you that gift. Let's all ask on Elisa's behalf that Hashem should give her that gift. We order and we heal her body. We order and we heal her nervous system. She should be able to trust Hashem's love for her so much that there's no need for anxiety. There's no need for it to protect her. Mm. What are you experiencing right now, Lisa? Um, very, very good feelings. And I, when I close my eyes, I see um, green fading into orange and yellow and uh, pink. Mm. Invite the anxiety into that and let it release and trust that. How does it respond? It it comes forward and settles down. Beautiful. A good heart you have. Put your right hand over your heart and repeat after me three times. I am loved, I am safe, and I can trust that. I am safe, and I can trust that. I am loved. I am safe. safe, And I can trust that. I can trust that. I am loved. Loved. I am safe. safe. And I can trust that. Hashem absolutely loves me. Hashem absolutely loves me. Hashem is absolutely protecting me. Hashem is absolutely protecting me. And I can trust that. And I can trust that. Beautiful. Just relax your arms now. Just be in that for 10 seconds more. Absorb that into your cells, into your nervous system, to your midas, to your das, Bina and Chochma, a makif around you, makif beyond that. Yud and Hay and Vav and Hay is the seal. There you have it. Beautiful. Wow, thank you. What What's very like for you? Yeah, tell it me. Was it was incredible. What was what was very interesting about this exercise is last night I was away from my young daughter and she was uh, very distraught that we were not together and she wanted hugs from mommy, literally having a, a meltdown. And I was on the phone with her and um, I was I was kind of trying this um, technique of just reassuring her, telling her to repeat after me, you are loved, you are safe, you are secure, I'm here, and I love you. And this, we repeated that over and over again, and she just, she she got it. Interesting. She it. Amazing. Interesting. So now Hashem gave it back to you today. Yeah. Eliza, how are you feeling right now, energetically, emotionally? Um, at peace. calm I still have tension a little bit right here good so you have I don't know if that's the weather it could Take be the weather the time. okay does anyone have any messages for Lisa in the box you can write us share a message for that process Lisa I've got some homework for you I want you to do that every day until the end of Hanukkah I want you to take 10 minutes I want you to talk to the pain in the back of your neck I want you to look for that feeling of anxiety I want you to build a relationship, build a kesha with that part of you, with that mida. Remember, when you speak to it, it's not the enemy. It's a fallen spark of Hashem. So validate it, give it love, help it understand what it's doing. Um, and Hashem will see. David says, beautiful heart, Eliza. 
Shmuel says it wasn't just a, a local non-global question. Ah, you are loved. You are greater, Lisa. Amazing, beautiful, Lisa. Thank you for sharing yourself and healing. We are all healing with you. Beautiful. So there's lots of messages for you to learn. Lisa, you let us know how it goes. We'll keep in contact, okay? Thank, Thank you, you for very joining much. us. Thank you. Love and blessings. Okay. So we went to Elisa. We didn't get Elisa, E-L-I-Z-A-H. So we left her waiting. So let's jump to her now. Hi, Rev, Rev Katz. I go by Liz. Hi, Liz. That's easier for me. How can we help you today? Um, well, two things. One is um, I have a recommendation for you. I, I don't know what your health issues are, but I... <laughs> Does it look like that's what we're doing right now? No, but I figured if I already have your ear and I feel like this could potentially help other people who are listening, it's a very fast recommendation, if you'll allow me. One sentence, go. Okay. There is a terrific healer author named Anthony William. He calls himself the medical medium. He's written uh, a book. People he's, the, he's the celery guy. Yes. Celery juice. Yes. Right. So that's all I wanted to share. That's it. Um, okay. You've all heard the celery juice. It's bitter. It tastes terrible. And it performs amazing miracles unless it doesn't. Okay. So good. It's, a, it's on the table. Thank you, Liz. Let's talk about you a little. Yes, thank you. Um, so I actually asked you a question a few weeks ago on another q and I remember call. you. Remind me. Yes. yes. It was about Judaism, not feeling like I had a Jewish soul, not... And... Right. At first we went in another direction, then we realized it was a question more about you. And you live in Jerusalem, and it sounded like your question was very much from a Jewish soul. So where are we up to today? So I feel... I have made tremendous strides in feeling a lot more comfortable being Jewish, um, even being able to stand up and say, I am Jewish, just having that as part of my identity. But, Since when? Um, this is recent. This is definitely in the last few weeks, I would say. Um, I Yes, the, really, there's a lot to be grateful for. But I, I, I was really just going to come on and say, here's my recommendation. And I just want to say, thank you. You helped me so much. But as I let that sit, for some reason, I started to realize that there is a little bit of shame that I'm feeling around um, being a religious person. Like I Hang on. Find let me go, let's go over this one more time. You said last time it was something about, I can remember the feeling of it, that if I'm Jewish, the whole world hates us or something like that. What was I it didn't you said? Because the Jews are hated by everyone. Yes. And I and feel how did okay. you resolve that in the last few weeks when um, the world hated us more than ever? True, but I, I do a lot of EFT tapping. So oh. I worked on my feelings around that and I feel okay about it. I'm just like, okay, the world can hate us, but <laughs> I love personally. So like that's that's okay, you know. Uh you Beautiful. be you, you know. Um Fine. but I but So I, today today's the question is the addition is what? The shame. Shame about just the idea of being religious because I tend to be somebody who I, I guess I would say I'm confused because on the one hand I think religion is basically just like a lifestyle choice if somebody likes it go for it go and follow that religion whichever one it is and is it can true? help I don't know because I do believe that there are miracles within the Jewish religion, I, I think also very possibly and likely within other religions as well. And so there is more to it than just a bunch of rituals just for the sake of doing it. Um, but I still feel really silly about it. There's a part of me that just feels really, really silly. Like, Liz, do, do, you, do you say things like, you know, nature is just, it's true, the laws of nature is just like if a person wants to do then jump off a cliff, you can, but if you want to fly, you'll fly. Do you consider the laws of nature random and everyone can follow them or not according to their heart's desire? I think so, yes. You do. So you think if a person wants to walk in front of a, a, a semi-trailer, the semi-trailer won't hurt them? Do you believe that? I think there is the tiniest, infinitesimally small possibility that it won't, but otherwise most likely it will. I think that oh, I think, well, I like we will. So this is the definition of nature anyway, because basically infinitesimally small means 
that according to statistics, it's likely that it will kill them. So you, like the rest of us, believe that reality has absolute rules. Gravity works. Is it possible for to jump into the sky and just keep flying? It's possible. Is it probable statistically? Yes. So you believe there's absolute laws of reality. So Torah and Judaism is just all about the spiritual laws of reality, right? If a person has a big ego, they're probably going to get slammed with their ego eventually. If a person puts out kindness and generosity, they can bring kindness and love and generosity back to them. There are many rules in the world which are spiritual axioms and spiritually true. So just like there's the laws of nature, the laws of science, the Torah is a book of the spiritual laws that exist in reality. Now, as science goes on, science finds out more and more that, for example, prayer is true. Fi science finds out that consciousness actually influences reality on a quantum level, right? So as science develops and moves along its evolutionary process, science discovers that intention can shift the physical world. That's the quantum slit experiment, right? And there is science that has said through people putting their attention on others, they've affected them. Science has shown evidence for psychic ability. So Torah is just revealing the future of science by saying there's absolute spiritual rules as well as there being scientific physical rules. And all the mitzvahs are really tapping into that. There's a mitzvah of Bikol Chalim. If somebody's sick, you can go visit them. Okay, so you don't have to come online. You can come say hi to me and my wife in our house. It's a general invitation. We have Shabbos guests each week. Wonderful. So with that in mind, I say to say that if a person's sick, you don't just go, gee, I hope this goes better. You literally go and visit them. And I say to the Gemara say, when you go and visit a person that's sick, you take away a part of the illness. You release them of that energy, of the negative energy. And today we know that what love and warmth and presence of others in the room really does help lighten the load. And today, even the sages say Kabbalistically that being in someone's presence and caring for them and having compassion when they're sick, in a level of consciousness, it kind of releases them energetically. So we see that the mitz each of the mitzvahs are revealing a spiritual axiom, a spiritual reality. Because we're more in the physical world, we're less spiritually attuned, we don't experience that directly. But those who have those sensitivities, and as science develops deeper sensitivities, we realize that these things are true and are absolute. So Kabbalah and Torah is really spiritual science. And, and the more we learn it, the more we become wise to the, to the rules that define the reality that we live in. Have you ever learned Kabbalah before, Liz? A little bit. Does it interest you at all? Um, I find it, I, I love the idea of as above, so below, and, you know, and things like that. But the the idea of the Sphero, it's kind of, it, it just, I can't quite take it in. Fine. It's time you learn some Kabbalah. It's time we give you a path to teach you how to take it in. I think it probably hasn't been explained to you before. Kabbalah is kind of like, Torah is kind of like if you switch on, if you switch this switch here, the light will come up there, right? They're kind of rules. If you tie this to your arm, if you light candles on the seventh day, if you wear tzitzis, if you cover your hair, if you dress sneers, they're kind of like rules. Um, but the Kabbalah is like you rip off the wall and you see the reason the switch turns on the light is because there's actually a circuit behind it and there's actually electricity running through it. So Kabbalah shows us what's happening. It reveals the rules of the scientific of, of the of the energetic spheres beyond the physical world that shows us for each of the mitzvahs we do why we do them and the effect that they have so if we start teaching some classes liz on kabbalah would you come to them for a couple and check it out yeah okay so liz is down would anyone like a class in kabbalah starting the next few weeks sometime you can all say yes and we can hook something up there you go fine so we're going to do an introduction to kabbalah Liz, we're going to move on. But at this moment, this idea of shame, how does shame connect to all of this? I think it's very physical world-minded, very focused on how things look in the physical world, that Jews have ways of dressing that can be strange to uh, modern, you know, to the modern look. And um, just different things that we do, The some of the rituals, are really strange like we just do it because you know if you're raised with it you don't really think into it but mm -hmm. if you see what why is that shame 
that's strange because we're on the outside and we don't know them. And when we do them, we learn them. They're beautiful. Shame towards who? I'm not sure. It's a great question. Mm. So that's what you're going to tap on this week till we speak next time. But I want you to put together shame with, I don't want to be a Jew because everybody hates me. Think how much you're defining your identity through other people perceiving me. We're so different and I feel shame. Everybody hates us and I don't want to be me. Go back to what we said right at the beginning of the session, that we spend our whole time being so sensitive to everybody else's needs that we diminish our own needs and become unconscious of our own needs until we lose ourselves in the process. It seems that there's a lot of you that's trying to find yourself through being sensitive to others and their perception rather than closing your eyes to them and saying, who am I and who do I want to be? Wow. That's extremely perceptive and I'm very grateful. Thank you. Shem should bless you with clarity and breakthroughs. Amen. Thank you very much. You are Amen. welcome. The Simcha. Amen. Thank you for your caring. Let's go to Rivka Crystal. Hi there, Rivka. Hi. Thanks for taking my question. The Simcha. Um, um, my question is, you know, I, I'm not a huge social media person, but I know that there's a lot of, yeah, I try. <laughs> um, definitely um, just kind of wondering what the role of social media is in, in, or if there is any role in it at all in terms of like supporting Israel, um, if it's at all beneficial or it's just a distraction. Um, and then I was I also wondering, question, right? Yeah. And then I was wondering if you can share some resources on, and the um and just if anyone like I I um Eliza, the first Eliza that came on who shared her struggles with food. So I can definitely relate to that. Um and I was wondering if you can maybe share some resources if someone's looking to do some deep inner work, um, how we sure. can feel that part. Sure. So let's start with the first one first. The need for social media. Well, the need for social media for the average human being is they don't necessarily need social media, right? You don't need it. You need food and drink. You need love. You need uh, meditation and, and to mitzvahs. But social media, we don't need. Um, there are kalim that are being revealed in our generation, tools and resources that have a very deep power for human consciousness. AI is one of them. And, and uh, social media and the internet is another of them. And this is what's called the Eitzadas Tovara. That means the mystics say that as we approach the time of Mashiach, there's new tools and new resources that will be revealed in the world that will allow humans' consciousness to rise. And But before, the principle in Kabbalah is when they first come into the world, they first come in a negative fallen form, but then through Das and hard work, we can elevate them up to a holy and healthy form. For example, we have a prophecy that at the end of days, Malahar's Day of Hashem, that the whole world will be full with divine consciousness and all of humanity will be united and speak one language with one heart together. And there's an idea that the more we purify our hearts and souls towards the end of days, humanity will unite, our consciousness will be united, we will, we will have incredible technology and wisdom that will create peace and abundance throughout all of the world. So when you look at the internet, you see fascinating, you see two things. One is humanity is suddenly attaining this incredible wisdom and access to wisdom, incredible knowledge, right? Anything we want to access, anything we want to understand is right there in front of us at the click of a button, number one. And you see that where there was separate communities and separate countries and total division in the world, you see right now in a moment, you can access a million people's thoughts and ideas and share them and interact with them. So in theory, that is a spectacular and beautiful thing. The unity that it creates and the bonding that creates and the shared human experience it creates and the shared wisdom that people all around the world can get access to wisdom and knowledge is a very beautiful thing. What's the problem? How clipper con millipree. That means that's the ideal, but that's not the reality. Today, 99.9% .9 of the internet is full of lies and distortion and garbage and selling and marketing and the worst things, right? To get truth on the internet is a very hard thing to find because there's so much noise. And the sense of unity, what we see on social media is just how 
dividing it is. It's probably the, the central cause today of the division that we see in politics between the left and the right, especially in America, is how the you the the internet has been used as a place to divide humanity rather than unite it. So it becomes a place where humanity can learn and grow and unite together, which is profound beyond words. But it is still in a highly dysfunctional stage. But we see that it's moving is in a messianic direction, but we don't have to take the pain and trauma that comes with that. Therefore, the purpose of it is it's shared knowledge and shared human experience in an incredible way. The challenges of it is in its fallen version, the knowledge is distorted, and rather than unity, it often creates division. So first of all, I recommend you do what my children do, which is don't, ne don't go on social media at all. My children never seen social media. They don't know what it is, and they're happier and healthy you know, because, not because of that only, but for that, number one. Number two is it is a place of, of the sharing of ideas. It is a place to share ideas. I'm not on social media because of the social part. I'm on the social media because there are millions of Jews there. And I believe that you have to go to the shuk, you have to go to the marketplace to share ideas. When you go to that place, you have to create tremendous boundaries and pretend this tremendous protection. Be very cautious for your own um, psycho-spiritual health and everybody else's as well. But I believe that some people, especially Jews in our generation, especially Torah Jews in our generation, we can't be in our ghettos anymore. And I think we have to get out and step into the conversation. We have to listen and hear and contribute. And that's where the conversation is today. Um, but I don't believe it's healthy for the average person. And I believe people would be happier and healthier and more connected to the others and themselves by staying off social media in general. It is designed as a poison for the mind. It is designed to get us literally chemically addicted so that we'll spend more time and energy there and less present with ourselves and present in our lives. But I do believe that for those who have to take on the burden, it is an important place to contribute to the dialogue, to reach people, to share Torah, to share ideas. Um, you have to be sane on it because you can't argue with people there. There's no point. Right? You have to create boundaries as well. But I do believe a value can come from contributing. As always, it's kind of a Chabad attitude. You know, why do they send, I don't know if you're Chabad, but why, you know, the Rebbe send people all around the world is, you know, aren't they going to be influenced by all these foreign beliefs? And, and the, you know, the, the fundamental teaching in a reductionistic way is if you are there to give, you're not going to receive. If you're there to build others and care for people, then you're not necessarily going to absorb in the same way as if you're bored, right? So to people that choose to go on, I say, you're going on to give and to build and to share. That's exactly what you should be doing with your time. And the second you're not doing that, get off and be anywhere else. But there's a value there. But for most people, I, I think it's more of a chasaran, more of a challenge than a value. Does that answer your question, Rivka? Yes. Um, and and like specifically, so that's kind of like general, right? Um, and specifically, I guess that applies to this whole war also, like where it almost feels like we're like fighting the war on social media too. Um, but it it's kind of like only only if that is only if you can do that from a, a place of um from das. I, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not it's not the job of the Jewish peoples to fight the war on social media. I believe there's a few individuals that have the communication still scared and the reach and the media savvy to do that. And I think everyone else should get out of the way, number one, because right. most nice, sweet people like yourself, you get on there, the pain and the anger and the frustration is going to overwhelm you much more than anything you can do. Let's be clear what it means to fight the battle on social media. Almost nobody at all has ever changed their personal political views from a post they've seen on social media, number one. So what is it? We're not getting over there to converting all these pro-Palestinian people to suddenly be pro-Israel. doesn't really happen very much. I'm sure it happens, you know, once in a blue moon. First of all, what you're doing is you're empowering your own people that are seeing in misinformation and giving them clarity, number one. Number two, what we're doing is were empowering their inner voice and sense of unity and giving them a vision. This is about unity. This is about Jewish love. We're, we're giving them a message of the goodness in there, right, to strengthen them. That's the second point. The third is you're, you're making sure that information isn't going out to the greater world and things are at least corrected. Things are at least corrected. So it's Sur Meirah and Asetav. 
But most people do not have the gifts, the communication skill, the reach to do that. And it's just too depleting on every level to be involved. And I'd say, if you think that's your mission, then make that your mission with boundaries. But if it's not your mission, there's better missions in the world. That's number one. Yeah. I hope that's helpful, Rivka. Very quickly, mm -hmm. the other point is, there's lots of wonderful tools. We have a program online at that interests you, elevationmastery.com, which teaches lots of tools. Um, EFT is great. IFS is great. EMDR is good for some people. Uh, people today are using in a healthy, professional way psychedelics, meaning if, if you find a professional, healthy environment that does support supports it in that way um, and, and does it in, in, a, in a healthy, supportive, professional way, that can be very empowering, important. Some people need meditation and men mental mastery skill sets. Some people have trauma and anxiety, and they need to be able to deep dive into that and release that. Um, there's lots of different tools. It's important to find a good tool. And it's important to find a talented facilitator of that. Um, and you have to find what works for you. Have you ever, ever done any of those tools, Rivka? There's also breath work helps some people some of the time. Ever tried any of these um, things? So I, I've looked into a lot of these things. Um, I don't mm -hmm. want to like give my whole life story here, um, sure. but I, um, if I, if I've reached out to you for like specific, you know, I guess resources based on my own needs. You can be... reach out through the website. You can send an email to the website um, okay. and that they can refer you to something there. I hope that helps. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great. So we're moving along. Let us go to where the magic button stops. Anna Feldman. Is there Anna Feldman there? Yeah. You're in Australia? Yeah, I am. We're in Australia. I've been like just like speaking to you through the through the ethers and then you called me out. It's just crazy. <laughs> so, no, I'm sorry, I was, I was going along the top row. Where in Australia are you? So we actually we left Sydney about nine years ago and moved up to uh, Bellingen and now we're at Emerald Beach near Coffs Harbour. So basically um, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> That's awesome. We're it's beautiful a... there. My father took me there a long time ago. I'm from Australia, you know. I, I, I know. I know well. So I, I, myself, my husband, Asher, have been following your work. We're good friends with uh, Simone Wine. I'm good friends ah, with Simone. Tamara, awesome. Daniel uh, and Tamara Khan in uh, in Jerusalem. Sure, and sure, fantastic. Now and yeah, good good friends. Okay, so Anna, I made a mistake, but I don't believe there's mistakes. So here we go. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to ask in your heart if you have one question to ask right now. What's that question going to be? For me personally, I'm I'm navigating a huge amount of anxiety, shock. Uh, the images just never, never leave me of what our people have been through. And I spend most of my time just disassociated, terribly traumatised, PTSD, just feeling very alone, I think, also because I'm so far away from a bigger Jewish community. Mm. I just feel like. Most of the time, I just feel like I want to be in Israel, but my life is here. <laughs> it's so, so hard to put a question to this. That's theory. the question. That's the question. <laughs> but I, that feeling is the question. I think it is about feeling on purpose, finding a way. <laughs> To feel connected and not so disassociated because it's too much. I'm one of those people that I am on social media because mm. I do have a voice and I'm coming up against the insanity of it all <laughs> because I feel like you, you know, like it's like I'm so clear in my moral compass <laughs> in who I am and how the world ought to be but it's not you know, everything is so upside down and it's just causing me so much mm. pain and I just sometimes don't know what to do with myself and I just feel far away from people and just being in the conversation and in in real life in a sense so it's wow. just 
is really hot. Does anyone else feel what Anna's feeling? <laughs> yeah, that's so. Thank you. I feel like Hashem threw us out into 2,000 years of exile. And with this event, he kind of, you know that kind of Batman light in the sky to call on Batman? Yeah. So I feel like he sent the Mag and David up to the sky and we all looked up and we were all like, man, we're so far away. And all these things that we got distracted with and all these places we are and relationships we're in. And it's not easy to come home. It's not easy to just get on a plane physically, emotionally, spiritually, with obligations that we have. Some of the relationships aren't open to that. But our soul and our heart is pushing in that direction. It's like a very ancient program that got turned on. Very ancient kind of tracking system that awakened within us. You know, those action movies where the guy's a sleeper but don't know they're a sleeper and someone says the code and suddenly they're like, wow, I have all these powers I never knew and all these gifts I never knew. It's like Harry Potter again. But we're not in places where we can get back so easy. That creates a deep yearning in our heart and a deep schism in our heart. That's not easy. I had that awakening when I was 24, living in Melbourne, Australia, being a film and theater director and running raves in my house. And and when that light turned on, it just shattered me because I was just shell-shocked that Israel mattered to me and my soul mattered to me. And Judaism's garbage and Israel's Zionistic dogma. And I was just like, what is this supernatural power and this pull? It's a family I never knew I had. It's Harry Potter. What are these powers within me? It's... Luke Skywalk, you know, what is this force that's awakening? Where did that come from? And what is this love that I have for these people in this place? And what is this gifts that I always thought was so uniquely me, but it's so uniquely ours. And it took yeah. me years to really unravel that, to get myself out of that. And I had to break off some very difficult relationships and to break off some very precious, beautiful relationships. Relationships I couldn't possibly imagine myself without that really shattered me. But it took me years to be here and root here and ground here and build here. When a person does that, they just feel so... I don't know what the world where it is. It's somewhere between integrated and unified and clear. It's clear that all your roots are planted in the right place. Australia's a long way away. And when I go to Australia, which I hate to do, I don't think I've ever talked about this publicly. When I hear the wind blow through the trees, I'm like, I feel I'm in a wasteland and Aborigines are walking around me. Mm. I feel like we're on their land and this is not our land. Mm. I feel like I'm talking like in the middle of Caulfield and Balaclava and then walking yeah. down the city in Flinders Street in Melbourne, Australia. I'm not saying that for political reasons. I feel it. I feel, what the heck are we doing here? This is their place and their energy. It's like I see those ghosts. It's like very intense for me. Wow. And that made me go, what is the place which is our indigenous land? What is the place when we walk on? I feel like I live in one of the most beautiful places, most stunning beaches and headlands, and I just feel like such a stranger here. And <laughs> it's not where I want to be. Right. It's where my son wants to be. It's where my, you know, it's where my, I suppose, family is right now, but it's not where I want to be. I went on a tour in Switzerland a few years ago. It was staggeringly beautiful and completely yeah. energetically empty. Yeah. And I came back to on the airport and there was a little hill and the sun was setting behind it. And I was just like, 
this is my home. Like the energy here is electric and Switzerland is technically beautiful. It's a stunning picture, but there's something here, which is, which is us, which is our people, which is our souls. Hashem is wakening us. It's this kind of tracking device that was buried within us for thousands of years and is turning on now. When was the last time you were in Israel? At least 10 years ago, 11. My grandmother passed away in Israel and we came. Would you come for a week? Yeah, I would. Come for a week? You have money for a ticket? Yeah. Okay, because we'd raise a few if we didn't. Come for a week. Come for a week in Israel. Connect to it here. Your soul is calling you. Your heart is calling you. Be here for a week. Go to Sfat. Watch the sunset in the hills of Sfat. Come to our Shabbos table. Go to the Kotel. It's safe here to do these things now. And allow your heart and your soul to be Charged, charged again. Don't feel far away. If you have to be there, be charged while you're there. Don't be running on empty. Connect to yourself, connect to your land. If you're that sensitive yeah. and there's something you're yearning for, you're yearning for nutrients that you haven't had. Give yourself the diet, the nutrients, yeah. and then go back and be the light you have to be there. Here's your sweet son. Hi there. We've lost your, your mic is off. Hi, this is Kiva. This is my son, Kiva Hi. Solomon. Hey, <laughs> Kiva Solomon. In Jerusalem. Nice to meet you. I'm just hanging out with your mother and 300 other close friends. <laughs> 300 other close friends. <laughs> We're all here in Israel. Kiva, what's your message for the people of Israel? This is your moment of truth, Kiva. Yeah, just hang in there until it's all all right. And, yeah, hopefully Hamas gets smashed. (laughs) (laughs) From your fist to God's ears. Thank you, Kim. Hang in there. Hang in there till everything's all right. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. What other advice is there right now? He's on point. Yeah. When are you coming? Would you come? Can you do it? Yeah, I can. I can. It's funny. I mean, I'm, I don't know if you know um, Jody Lowe, Jody and Ellie, and they they've got a few kids. They're in Thailand at the moment, and we're we're heading over there in a couple of weeks just to just just downtime. There's a lot of Israelis there. We've got friends there. Mm-hmm. The Australian Jewish. There's a Chabad house in Koh Samui. We're planning on spending some time there doing Shabbos there. And it just felt like the closest kind of way that I could connect. I know it sounds ridiculous, but <laughs> just getting out you know, a just, bit. You know, it's been it's been a bit scary and I haven't quite been able to make the mental leap to to actually just take myself. But that invitation just feels and the fact that you called me out. <laughs> there you go. Me- Hashem's giving you the mental leap. Hashem is strongly giving the mental leap. I think it's going to be game changing for you to be here for one week, for one week, to be at the wall, yeah. to be at Tel Aviv, to be at the beach, to be in Sfat, to be with the people here. Yeah. And if you have a gift on social media, you'll you'll share that as well with the people there, and you'll share it with your heart, and you'll share it with Kiva, and yeah. you're a long way away. So you know, come back, be access some of that light and energy, and let it let it charge you again. And let's let's see where it takes you after that. Please say hi if you come. And we'll talk. I definitely Shem should bless you and give you clarity and strength. You should be a light and you should return in power here and return to the world in strength. Right, Amen. Can be continued, Anna. Okay, so here we go. We have time for one more person. Um, we are going to go. You'll forgive me. Let's go to who is here? Who is here? Um, Anita. Let's go to Anita. Hello, Anita. Last for today. I think Diana was praying, but it didn't turn out. We went to Anita. Hi, Anita. How are you? Much for having me here tonight with you. Sure. I, have a, 
I have a pretty simple question. We do live in Italy, in Milano. My nine years old son goes to a Jewish religious school. He wears tzitzit and kippah. But the problem is that when he goes to sports and everything, he mingles and he goes to classes with Italian boys. So they are making fun of his tzitzit and the kippah and everything. And he's very, he's getting very ashamed of that. And during Shabbat, he asked me also, mom, what should we do? Because somehow I don't understand why Hashem killed so many people in Israel. Are they coming to pick us up also here in Italy? So I was speechless. I wasn't able to say anything. I was just like freeze. I didn't know what to say on a boy that is eight years old. Because at school, they have the policy to try to protect them from the atrocities. They they instructed the families. We don't have to show them images. Everything that you already spoke about it, that the school has the same point of view on that. So I'm asking for an advice, please. Wow. What's his name? Aaron. Aaron. I don't know what to say. How long have you been living in Italy for? I have been living here almost uh, 12 years. It's a long time. How long are you planning on living there for? <laughs> if I could, I am on the same situation, the same feeling that we just shared with Anne. Totally the same. I can't, right. I can't tell you anything more on what, what she expressed with her tears and with the energy that she transmitted screen. Right. I think we, we, all, we all felt it. I mean, what I want to do is take your little boy and give him a hug and I want to bring him to Israel and I want him to wear his kippah and tzitzis around thousands of boys that are wearing a kippah and tzitzis and I want him to know he's the most normal, healthy thing in the world and he never has to feel ashamed. My wife lived in Italy for many years. She's fluent in, yeah. in uh, Italian. And she always tells me, like, when she got off the plane in Israel for the first time, and they said, Happy Hanukkah, up in the airport in Ben Gurion. She said all her life she'd seen Merry Christmas. She never occurred to her there'd be one place in the world where the Hanukkah was the normal thing, where the kippers and sitzes are the normal thing. They right? They're ignorant. They're not in a bad faith, as right. would be in other countries in Europe. They, they, they don't have the access to the Jewish cultural, I would say, environment. They don't know. Right, right. So your sweet boy thinks he's alone in the world. What's he like as a person? He's a very smart boy. He's very, he's a normal boy. He's an outgoing. <laughs> he's, right. he's funny. Okay. So the first question is, the first question is, his kipper and his sitsis and the boys pick on him. Now, assuming we know the, the basic answers, so assuming when the Jewish team is playing with the non-Jewish team or whatever's happening there, that there's people telling the non-Jewish team that they have to respect both sides. And are those basic guidelines in place? Yeah. They are, but boys are boys, right? Yeah. Okay. How are we going to give this kid such a fire in his belly? <laughs> that when they pick on him, it's going to give him strength and, and passion. How are we going to make him know that it's such a beautiful thing? And that when people do something beautiful and powerful, everybody else gets jealous. But that's because they really want it and they really respect themselves. How are we going to make it for him that he realized that this is the most amazing thing that he can do is stand up pr proud in his life with the Jewish people, and that he's fighting a fight for every single one of us, and we're fighting for him too. Does but he his, connect? The problem, is, the, the problem is that the school and I would say the security keep telling us in here that we have to hide every sign of being Jewish mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that you have to wear a cap, that you have to put the tzitzis in, the, in your pants. Right. So it's a kind of a contradiction somehow. It's a contradiction. Okay. So what is the distinction that needs to be made between those two? The distinction is, first of all, the core has to be 
that we are safe and Hashem loves us and we are strong. And 0.001% of Jews were hurt. But the rest of us have never been more strong and never been united and never been more powerful together. Right? So statistically, mathematically, he's at a very, very low risk of that. It's not going to happen, number one. He has to know that and feel that, number one. Two is there's something called the shtadlis, which is reasonable effort, reasonable effort. And reasonable effort means when I'm going a certain place, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, when we ran to the, to the bunker in our house, we don't really have a bunker, we have a downstairs thing where the siren goes off. So I realized that all these parents are calling me up and they're all kind of saying, our kids are terrified in the bunker and they're terrified. And I think it's a very funny thing, Anita, that kids are terrified in the bunker. Why kids terrified in the bunker? You're in a room by yourself. What are you terrified of? Is it bombs falling from the sky? But the kids aren't seeing bombs falling from the sky. The kids are terrified because the parents are terrified. The kids are terrified because the parents say, go, 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 run, 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 no, don't see that, pick up there, go there, it's scary, there's gone, you have two seconds to get there. When the parent embodies that fear, then the child says, now there's nothing to be afraid of. In our house, we, we dance and sing to the bunker. We chose a song that we all sing. Nobody runs, that's the rule. Nobody runs, we'll be there, we'll find. This is statistically, it's so unlikely a bum will ever hit Jerusalem, especially, God forbid, our house in Jerusalem. There's nothing to run to, there's nothing to run for. We go, because I always say, it's established. If there's a bum falling, everybody goes to the shelter. Do we have snacks there? Do we have toys there? We have a good song to sing. It's not what people are telling them. It's the energy that we're investing in that. As one of my rabbis say, you have to give the light without the heat. You have to say, this is what we're doing. But you don't add the fear and the tension to it. And you're able to make a distinction in there. That's number one. Can you hear that distinction, Anita? Anything. Yes. Okay. So that's something to think about. The fact that we take off our kippah, it doesn't have to be take off the kippah because terrible things are going to be happen. It can also be... You know, we do establish in the world. Statistically, it's so unlikely you're safe. It's amazing. We're blessed. We're doing good things. It's just one of these things we put a cap on. Hashem also wants you to wear a cap sometimes. And again, if he's absorbed the pain of it, it's not so easy to unravel it. But for the attitude, you can teach a child or human being to do efforts without having to absorb the fear and the pain and anxiety around it. That's number one. Two is he has to believe that this thing we're a part of is normative and is beautiful and meaningful and powerful. He has to believe that he's fighting for something worthy. He has to know by kids picking on him, that's not because it's a, he's a victim, but it's an opportunity to be a hero. He has to give him stories and teachings of people that stood up against the Jews or people that's picked on anyone in the school ground. I'm sure there's a million Hollywood movies and they found the courage and the strength and the vision and the love to do it and to celebrate it. Maybe take all the kids in the class and make them all tell a story of one time they've done it. Maybe there's a Holocaust survivor of one time they stood up against a Nazi and showed them who they are. There's this amazing video of, of two of the women that came out of Hamas's uh, van and she turned around and looked 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 at did you see that video and she looked him in the eye we don't know what she was saying but you could tell this woman's in charge of all of hamas right now right okay. if you create for him a narrative that every time this happens it's his chance to powerfully tap cloud Yisrael's energy and avram and yitzhak and yaakov and all the Sadiqim and all the survivors of the Holocaust and say, we're in charge and my Judaism is awesome. And he has a great story to go back and tell his friends every time he does it. Then this is a tremendous chance. It shouldn't destroy his self-esteem. It should build his self-esteem. It should give him courage and strength and clarity. And they should love doing it. I love when people pick on me in class and say something stupid about a uh, uh, Jews are causing genocide because I have 50 killer answers to knock them into the ground and it becomes fun. And he should feel that my people are so beautiful and my mitzvahs are so holy and we're so going to overcome these enemies that when someone says something stupid, he has an awesome opportunity to shine. That's his moment to shine. And if we can give him that and empower him with that narrative, he's not a victim. He has, he's, he's intelligent. You said he's outgoing, right? Teach him to smile and to laugh and to say, wow, Hashem is turning my light on now. And the more I have to stand up to this darkness, the greater the light I become. You show him that. You let him feel that. You give him the joy of that. 
there's nothing in his life that will stand in his way. It'll be a blessing that will that will help him build his life to extraordinary heights. Do you hear me, Anita? Totally clear. Okay. Hashem should bless you. Come back, introduce him to us. We'd like to meet him. We want to hear the stories. And you're going to give him the words. What do they say to him? How is he going to respond to it next time? How is he going to smile and wink at them? What's that? to you. Amen. Thank you so much, Anita. To be continued. Saiga benched. Wow. Okay, my friends. It is the end of the show. How are you all doing? You all still there? Okay. Well, I'm amazed what Shem puts in your head. When I was hearing that, I was like, what are we going to help with this little boy? I want to know how this little boy's going. We should bring him up. We should talk to him. Emotional check-in. What did you absorb there? What's your main takeaway? How was that experience for you? He's a superhero. Perfect answer. Maccabee. He's a Maccabee. Anita, he's a Maccabee. It's Hanukkah. Anita, tell him. It's Hanukkah. Tell him the stories. Tell him he's Maccabee. He's the Maccabee. This is his moment. Get the, get the McGill and write his name into it. Okay? He's Esther Amalka. He's going to stand up to the kings and all the people in the world. This is the story. This is his moment. Amazing. Thank you. Yes. I want a one-line Main takeaway, emotional check. And thank you, Rabbi Katz, you're a Jew, hero, Jew per hero. Powerful strength. Thank you. Beautiful. Wow, there's so many messages. Gratitude coming home. He needs to be empowered. It was emotional. <laughs> thank you for your time. So many revelations hit upon a lot of inner stuff. Uplifting, emotional. Viola, I can't read that whole fascinating power guide. To complete the circle, return to the starting point. Thank you so much for shedding a light on the connection between narcissistic relationships and what's happening in the world right now. I've been battling this with, on a private level for years, and I just realized how much of the outside world is a reflection of what is challenging me inside. Right? Right? So this show is for you, Viola. I've been grappling with the shadows and the accompanying pain for, a lo for too long and is a cast a dimness over my light and love for life. What you share with us is so beautiful and healing. Baruch Hashem, thank you, Hashem. The insights have been incredibly enlightening and validating. Tadara Baba Vakasha. Trust in Hashem. Welcome home, Jews. Love everyone. Rafua Shalema, thank you. Boundaries with joy. Rafua Shalema, thank you. I feel like I got tools. Yay. Love your ability to talk to Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Great self awareness. It's been a beautiful time learning and deepening inside myself for an hour. So there's lots of beautiful messages. There's 44. Now there's 54. I can't keep up. This is a group bracha. Okay. Number one, join our WhatsApp groups. Share the link to our WhatsApp groups with your friends. If they want access to these classes, we're keeping them up for free. We want to give you everything we can. Enjoy it. Um, the Elevation Project has just shared the link if you want to join our WhatsApp groups there. Fine. What else do I have to tell you? Um, we may be coming to New York. I don't know. Blee Neda, but watch out for that. Um, that's all. That's all. Hashem should bless you all. Pray for us all. We will pray for you. Hashem should bless you in Ruchnius and Gashmir. Hashem should protect our people and, and help us build the boundaries to keep away the darkness, to empower the light so we can shine out to the world, transform it all back to Hashem. Much love and blessings to be continued over and out.